Hello, 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 and welcome to the Poncho Perspective, a show that really deals with discussions on the African American art world. I know y'all haven't seen me in a little while. I took a little break from the Poncho uh, Poncho Thongs. We'll probably bring that back sometime next month. But I uh, got a couple of really exciting things going on, so I want to try to include you. Uh, my guest today, man, is a real special person. Uh, I've been knowing him for 30 years, man, or more. And um, there are a lot of people that are in this business who, uh, and we'll have this discussion a little later on, um, that have stayed in the business or took a hiatus and came back to the business. This young brother is out in uh, Detroit, hailing from Detroit. Matter of fact, I can say he's the baddest man in Detroit, really. Yeah, I've done quite a few shows in Detroit. But this guy was one of the first few guys I started showing with in Detroit. So I wanted to take a little time to introduce you to him and his concept, what he's trying to do, what he sees in the art world right now. Uh, I think his viewpoint is very, very important. And uh, so rather than me uh, keeping on with the riff, I'm going to bring in my guy and we're going to introduce you to Mr. Ian Grant, CEO of Emoja Fine Arts. What's happening, Ian Grant? What's up? I'd like to say good afternoon. And I want to chop it up with my little brother, Poncho. Notice I said little brother here. Hey, hey you are officially my big brother. Uh, and I, I ain't mad. I need a couple of big brothers, man. What's going on with you, brother? Oh, Poncho, we're so excited about what's going on in the art world. And we're so excited to have you coming here on your national tour and to choose Detroit as one of the first stops. But before we get into that in your book, Pancho, can you tell us why they call you Pancho? How did you come up with the name Pancho? Man, you just asked me the most trivial question that everybody's been asking me from the beginning. But since you asked, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there was an old TV show called The Cisco Kid. Mm -hmm. My dad uh, was a fan of the show, made me a fan of the show. Uh, Cisco Kid had a sidekick named Pancho. So it was a sidekick thing between me and my dad, because I am a junior. My real name is Larry O'Neill Brown Jr. Did you know that? No, I didn't know the O'Neill. You know. so You've Poncho, been hiding that for years. Yeah, Poncho, no, not really. It's, it's, it's public knowledge, man. Remember, this is 40 years of information. And, right. and you just evaded hearing about it, that's all. You never <laughs> asked me that in all the years I've been knowing you. <laughs> well, you always put the, every time I start talking, you go to Poncho real quick. <laughs> Or you go to Poncho Con, you know. I mean, I just hey, don't man. that opportunity. It's all about branding, brother. You know, we try to keep it moving, man. Hey, man, tell us, tell us about the history of Umoja Fine Arts and the different iterations of that business, man. Well, I'll give you a quick overview. First of all, Umoja Fine Arts was founded in 1996 here in the Detroit Southfield area. We started out as publishers and distributors of African American art. And that was very, very key. We did not even have a gallery showroom at that particular point in time. We had over 4,000 galleries within the United States. And today, after 2007 and 2008, with the recession and everything that's going on, we only have about 350 galleries across the United States. So we used to service and sell on a wholesale and a distribution level where galleries would call us and order from us and we will be sending tubes out all the time and so we were able to get into the pretty much the gallery business because we always had internationally acclaimed artists or different artists here at emoja fine arts signing the print signing the paperwork so people wanted to always be able to come to emoja so they could meet the artists and they could take pictures with them and that continued to happen today but now we have moved strictly on the gallery side of the business well, you know, my man left out a couple of blanks, but uh, that's what two of us are here to fill in. You see, he came along uh, at a time uh, between 1985 and 2005, Cosby Show era, when it was in the big major explosion in the African-American art realm. OK, and for the most part, that 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 time frame was not documented. So we will hear us in our discussion having this dialogue about that period. Yeah, the golden uh, era period. Yeah, it was it was really something that uh, a lot of us hadn't experienced. Like he said, he uh, serviced uh, 4,000 galleries. We were around 3,000 galleries across the country. And then in 19, 
uh, 20 uh, to 2006 when you know the combination of 9/11 and the, mm -hmm. the uh, you know the whole implosion of the economy in the U.S. Uh, that made all of those galleries close. So you're talking about we went from 3,000, 4,000 galleries down to less than 100 within a couple of years. So, um, and that's why it's so important that I wanted to introduce you to Ian because uh, Ian was in uh, professional life for many, many years after, because everybody, I mean, it, it, it affected everybody, not just African American yeah. art market, it affected the whole market itself. I mean, you're talking about a time when Art Expo was the biggest show uh in the united states and yeah it, and, and, took and, down, it and, even took down art expo right and we always traveled with at least five or six artists in addition to that poncho i was in the corporate world as a sales and marketing executive for over 38 years so i just retired last june so my goal is to scale the business up quickly and we're doing that right now to take national and global distribution so we've worked on digitizing the business all of last year but I want to talk about you a little bit, Poncho, and you choosing Detroit as your first stop on your national tour. I'm so excited about this book. I'm going to have to show it. And this book is heavy, too. This book right here is called Poncho Retrospective. And in this book, you have over 300 pages, over 300 images, unheard of. I'm just going to open this up for you a little bit right here so we can just see some of the different pages, some of the different artwork that Poncho has right here. And it's really, really a beautiful book that he's going to feature here at Emoja Fine Arts. In addition to that, he's going to have originals that he's going to be bringing in, his original artwork. Emoja Fine Arts, that's one of the things we have done. We have moved from Prince, pretty much, Jaclays, to being a strong original house, okay? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you in the Detroit art market that we have to be within the top three of selling African-American art images, originals which is very, very key and important. Mm -hmm. Now, Pancho, I want, to tell, want you to tell the people why it's so important for you, for them to come out and meet you, just get a chance to talk to you as an internationally acclaimed artist, your perspective over the last 40 years, and why they should come and see you. Because one of the things that I'm seeing before you answer that is that right now within the marketplace, we don't have that many shows going on on an international level like Emoja is trying to feature, okay? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of local shows with a lot of local artists. Mm -hmm. And so in the community, a lot of the people themselves and guests don't know the international market. So mm -hmm. that's, I come from the music industry, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's like saying, okay, all right, you're in the music industry, but you know Big Sean, you know, all the Motown people, but you don't know Beyonce, you don't know Jay-Z, you don't know Kanye and and Drake and all these different people because you don't know the international market. So we have to educate, 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 and we have to make a big investment over the next two or three years to make sure that the international artists continue to flow through Detroit. They used to come to Detroit 10, 15 years ago on a regular basis, but we're not seeing that today. So we're one of the few galleries that's putting that out there. Well, what I'm going to tell you is that there is a regional scene and there's a global scene. So I've been seeing this trend really for the last 20 years. And what, and what we're talking about, you know, we've been knowing each other 30 years. You're mm -hmm. talking about a generation and a half. So there's some people that's not supposed to be connected who weren't a part of that time. Remember, our movement happened uh, before the Internet, the advent of the Internet, before the advent of social networking. So. And you're talking about a, a, a real implosion of the art business that needed some reconstruction. And the, 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 the uh, infrastructure of that business also changed. So when we start talking about who knows who, that's the wonderful thing about art is that it's, a, it's an open mm -hmm. playing field. There's no way everybody will know everybody. But what I will say is that we're, we're actually administering to at least two or three different generations of people and their individual exposure. And so, I mean, think about it. 30 years is enough time. Most of my older clients from the early 80s, mm -hmm. they've either passed on and passed their work on to their children or passed their work on to somebody that didn't know. You so know, that's building generational wealth. So when you look at building generational wealth, we mm -hmm. should not only look at building wealth locally, we should look at building that wealth internationally 
across the spectrum and across the globe. So mm -hmm. um, this is part of collecting the art besides liking the art. I think when you first start out, it's about, I like that image, you know, and I got to make sure it matches my place and this, this, and this, even though we try to tell people you want to be a little bit eclectic, but when you're collecting, you want to collect globally and internationally. So therefore your collection will be at the highest value when you're building generational wealth that you will either pass on or sell. So talk about that. I, a little like, bit. I like the fact that you're using words like generational wealth, but what I will tell you is that most people who get into African-American art, that piece is not first. It never has been first. Mm -hmm. We're the kind of people, we walk into a gallery, we get moved, we like it, we can afford it, we take it home. And sometimes we take it home and still don't understand what it is. And it takes other forms of education to get to a point of buying for investment and, 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 and you know, talking about intergenerational wealth. So we have the big disadvantage that we've been doing this so long that we can make a judgment call based on what we've seen. And I think that's that's what we got to be careful of because at the very beginning of our market, it was all about education. It was people seeking out their culture. Mm -hmm. They hadn't seen themselves represented anywhere. You know, they were longing to see themselves uh, depicted in any way or fashion. So, so that's part, we'll talk course. about some of the TV shows you are on them, because this is how a lot of our people were able to see themselves depicted, you know, by some of the um, different TV shows, some of the different uh, movies in the background, yeah, on and was, on and that on. That was a phenomenon that started doing this market that we're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. you saw all kinds of things happen. So a different world was probably one of the bigger ones for me because they had three of my pieces on the show for more than four seasons. So it became, some of my work became big college pieces, big uh, HBCU pieces because they were featured on that show at that particular time. Uh, but to get back to what you were saying about this intergenerational wealth and this whole focus on buying originals, the whole market has evolved to that now. Uh, before, this first part of this market was about accessibility because if it wasn't for um, technology, we couldn't afford to even uh, have pieces that were on Good Time. If Good Time's pieces were available mm -hmm. back then, that market may have blown up back in the 70s. You know, if if if, if George Jefferson had work on his walls, which he did not, lost opportunity, it would have changed even then. But by the time the Cosby Show came, a couple things happened. Uh, not only did the Cosby Show feature works of African-American artists throughout the whole set, but also printing, the printing industry had done an evolution. So suddenly we were able to reproduce things. So I'm trying to educate folks so they can understand how this thing started. It's not like it just, this thing started overnight. There was no, we, we've been working at this for yeah. over 30 years. Pancho, yeah. this is very, very key and important to me as we talk to people and we try to not only bring them up to speed on the art market, but in life. You know, we see a lot of people when they get challenged today or building confidence. Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you had, Pancho. In 1996, there was an 11 alarm fire um, yes. that burnt down the total building that you were in. Yeah. Um, for blocks. And then in addition to that, you lost all your artwork. That yeah. was a time gracefully, Poncho, that you could have exited the marketplace and said, hey, I'm out. You know, I lost everything. I, everything. I, I think that what happens is that we, we, we're not, we're, we're people of perseverance, man. It's not like I decided to do something heroic. It was mm -hmm. not in me to not do it because it was impossible for me to exit. See, that's the difference between art dealers, gallerists, and people that are not creatives. This is in our spirit. We can't stop it. It's part of our, it's part of our fiber. It's not just an ability, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate that I was kind of on an upward trajectory when my fire happened in 1995. And uh, man, it was amazing what I saw. It was like, I got so much support from my artists. I got support from the, my gallerists, my dealers. Uh, the, the distributors. I, I was young, so I, I got the chance to see what the effect was of my work. I got to see what mm. haters do. <laughs> I got to learn a whole lot of stuff through this situation, but I also knew with the momentum of the business that I could probably get myself back in the swing in about three years. And I did, but it, it was at the sacrifice of family, relationships, fatherhood, and a bunch of other things. So 
you know, it's not a beautiful story, but that's the trial and error part of this mm. business. But what I can say is that the followers that I've um, amassed over those years, even if they're not buying, they still support me. And so my goal now is just to expand my reach. And that's why I picked someplace like uh, Detroit. Detroit has always been one of the markets, thanks to you bringing me in the first time. Yeah. You know, and you always seem to like the Detroit swag. Tell me what you like about Detroit and the people. You always no, talk about that. No, I don't Detroit like it. Swag. I don't you, like you I don't laugh at it a little. No, a little bit. You I don't, I don't like the Detroit. Sponsor, but let, let us know. What you like about the Detroit yeah. people? Because you I love know. coming here. You we know, have a conversation years years in, years out. Out. See, mm -hmm. I don't like I don't like the Detroit swag. I'm from Baltimore, so that was always a clash. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, we were always out there with our pockets. I, I tell we you, man, Detroit, it's like every other. That's why, as you were describing your market and where they are today, Detroit has always had its own flavor. And that's the thing I loved about what we were doing back then, man. We were traveling to Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, California, Philly, New York, New York. You name it. If it was an art center, we were there. This thing was really in your face. We were in a community, in these shows that were being created. I mean, you had art festivals, you had these, uh, you had a multitude of events that came up during that period of time. We were doing at that time events for eight to 10 days at a time that included Absolutely. not only visual art, but dance, music, all of it. Whole bit. And so we had a whole culture that included exactly. the Annie Lees of the world, that included the Charles Bibbs, William Tolliver, um, Paul. You name Benai. it. On and on and on. You, you could great. name a list of about a good 120 artists that became rock stars during that period of time because of the accessibility factor. Because long before that, that was not part of the art business. It wasn't fashionable for you to meet the artists. And, 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 and it was always a rep up front, a museum up front, a gallery up front the artists would never seen. Mm -hmm. And the thing about this movement is that it was in your face. You know, you got to come to your mall down the street and you saw these people for the first time in your life. And so it really changed the whole paradigm of the business. It changed uh, the, the culture piece is big because, again, if we were that hungry for culture then and, and it fed into this explosion, then I guess the question becomes, where do you think we are now? Because mm -hmm. there's a new group of people coming in. So as a gallerist, what do you see is the biggest difference between the market we were administering to in the 80s versus what you're administering to now? Well, the biggest thing that we saw as a business of Mojo Fine Arts, number one, and this has happened over the past three years, um, is we have moved pretty much from selling prints and jaclays or archival pigment prints to where our sales, 90% of our sales are original. So that is the great thing about the Detroit marketplace. Um, People come in and they're looking for original art. They want original on their walls. Well, this and is so what I'm going to say to you. See, why you're giving me the microcosm of what's happening in Detroit, that same thing is happening across the United States. Right. It's just that, and I think there's a couple of things that's happened. And I'll explain, I'll break it down real simply. In our time, there was the offset lithograph. We were shooting, we were aiming for mass accessibility. Okay. Technology came in with the G Clay and more expensive reproductions. And a lot of artists stopped doing major publishing of pieces because they were really intimidated by the quantity, how they were going to distribute them. Uh, the, the, the digital technology and the G Clay technology was four to five times more expensive. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it naturally evolved to people seeing so much. And this, that's the biggest change you now is that everybody's seeking, I'm talking about drawings, sketches, small originals, medium-sized originals. That's mm -hmm. just where people's interests are now. And, and I, mean, I think it comes back from the three key things. I take it from real estate where we talk about education, education, education. Mm -hmm. They talk about location, location, location. Mm -hmm. So this is some of the things that we're doing. Um, we're getting ready to start shooting live with our podcast that we're working on. We spent the last year digitizing the business. So we've brought, you know, gallery managers on like um, Marcel um, to help digitize the business. We're kind of done that now so we now move to a pos state to be able to understand our pos data and everything um we see our website e-commerce website operating at 30 
40% of our business. And this has been an incredible year for us. By June, we hit the target numbers that we were looking for to do all year. So it's incredible. And we still have our Basel to go yet. We still have your event to go yet. So we're just looking at a total explosion in this marketplace. But again, we will continue to invest. We will continue to bring the international artists in because we're not just bringing international artists in. The thing that Emoja Fine Arts is doing, we're at least always featuring two local artists with the international artists. So well, I for- notice in your in your promotions, you use international artists, you use uh, premier artists, you use emerging artists. Explain to the audience what that means to you. Well, what that means overall, there's different levels of the artists coming up and how they get into the marketplace and the marketing portion of everything. And that also reflects on their pricing. Okay. So therefore, if we have an emerging artist and there, they might have a piece that's an original that's 36 by 48. Someone could get that piece for a thousand dollars and maybe $1,500. Okay. But then when you go to a premier artist for a 36 by 48, I'm going to stay with the one size, that particular piece might be 3000 or 3,500. Now, when you start going to our internationally acclaimed artists, that same particular piece will going to be 5,000 on up to 20,000. So what some people said to us with our last show was that, listen, we miss some of these artists, you know, like the Marcells of the world, the Rosemary Summers of the world when they were $1,000. So we would like you to at least bring in another artist that you think has some potential that we could build with because we want a larger piece. We don't want to have to spend a thousand dollars for eight by 10. So we want to be able to spend a thousand dollars or $1,500 and and to be able to have some 36 by 48 and some larger pieces in our home. So we brought Lauren scary to the table. Okay. And then we have Joyce Jeffrey with her skills and her talents. We have even brought in Abe Ilo from Texas, the late great, my mentor, one of my mentors, Annie Lee grandson. He's coming in from Texas. He's going to be here. Your guy, Pancho, our guy. And um, we brought him up from when he was nine and 10 years old. So that's nice to just be able to look back to the market and um, to be able to see the people that has developed. Now, with that happening and we we could watch Abe as he grew from nine and 10. What made you, Pancho, want to get into the art business? What triggered you? And what kept you now 40 years in this business steadily? Well, um, I was challenged early because I used to like Frank Frazetta and Boris Vallejo. At that time, they had calendars out in the 70s. And you would see uh, customized vans driving through the neighborhood that had their work on the side of the van. At that time, I didn't even know who these people were. And finally, I went to a bookstore and I started seeing these guys' works being published. And that was a, that was the catalyst to me saying, hey, I need to figure out how to do this. Had no mm-hmm. idea how I was going to do it. There was uh, really not a support system for me to learn. So I embarked on trying to learn how to publish. Thankfully, my father was a printer. So the printing mm-hmm. language in the printing industry wasn't uh, uh, wasn't foreign to me. I was printing business cards with my dad in the kitchen when I was a kid. That's how I made a little extra money here and there. And so those things all kind of folded in. I became a publisher in 1985. Melvin Graphics was the name of my company at that time. And we focused on promoting artists in the DMV, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia uh, primarily. And I went to Art Expo. I went to the Art Buys Caravans and pretty much where I met you. Um, we were publishing and distributing work. And at that time, uh, prints were what where people felt comfortable uh but the accessibility factor was also a big thing too uh people weren't looking for originals at that time uh they were just wondering how much they could stretch uh, the money they had in their pocket with the most for their buck and so prints became that thing and accessibility is very very important uh so that's the time that that's that's the biggest thing that's changed now is that new artists are coming into the game and i call it the game because it really is and they don't have a reference point to what we did in 1985 to 2005. They just don't. It's right. like it was and, a and They don't have the overall history. Like when you started out, Poncho, no. before you and I even knew each other real well, fortunately, you were working with my uncle, Uncle mm-hmm. Gary Jones. He's uh-huh. now retired to Florida, but um, he was your color separator. 
Mm-hmm. So basically, a color separator is an individual that would take yeah. your work and shoot it. They would separate it on the films. They would mm-hmm. put it into the different colors, like mm-hmm. blue, red, green, Cyan, and yellow, black. And black. That's right. Same and colors was, in your printer. It was printed on a printer. These printers were one yeah. fourth the size of a uh, um, block. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had to learn that whole technique and that whole yeah. process. See, I, I jumped into it. that. I jumped into that early. In the early 80s, I published my first pieces like 81, 82. Mm -hmm. Uh, Through trial and error, they had a a bunch of printers you can go to that would do 200 or 100 on on this canvas feeling paper. (laughs) Out of Dayton, Ohio, I can't think of the name of the company that used to do that printing. But uh, again, my father being a printer demystified some of that for me as an artist. You see, um, and, and I was one of the first or I should say the few artists that embarked on self-publishing their work. Charles Bibb was one, Paul Goodnight was another. Mm -hmm. And then many other artists began to come into the fold a later on. I started off pretty much out the blocks doing the Art Buyers Caravan. So my name had already trickled into uh, my pieces reaching into galleries before a lot of artists did. Uh, Most of my peers are 10 to 15 years older than me. So I had a great head start on understanding how the business was structured, how what, what what publishing was, and to see what this this culture cry was all mm-hmm. about. Yeah, and I think we see an influx of people in this business, Poncho, because of a couple of things. You could get in the business maybe starting with about two thousand dollars, and you could talk to some artists that you could get their work. But you cannot sustain big, in this business. It costs hundreds and thousands of dollars to sustain no, in this business. And this is where I think a no, lot of no, people no, are no, tricked. No, let, let's let's get the people a real start, and that's your opinion. But people didn't have that kind of money when they started off. They had enough money to get rent. Most mm-hmm. of the people was living off of whatever they sold out their shop. I know people were selling out of their cars. I mm-hmm. knew people were selling out of their houses. And so there were many other things that came into play to enter the art business. You know, you don't need nothing for the art business but desire because you don't need accreditation for it. All you need is the, 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 the hunger, the desire, and the passion, the love for art, and a couple hundred dollars. And you can start just about anything you want to start in art because there's enough people to feed in it. It's a little different now because mm-hmm. that infrastructure has changed, but the basic principle is the same. People buy what they can afford, and now because of what's available, see, people buy what's available. So if you say you don't sell prints, but not a lot of galleries are running prints now. You know, right. And, right. back then there were very few originals on the wall. Back then, exactly, uh, the originals didn't start showing up. Originals didn't really start showing up till like the, the mid nineties. Right. That's and what we'll just go say, back hey. a little bit, Pancho. You mm-hmm. know, the first artist that I ever gave in Philadelphia was the great Romar Bearden himself. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and I worked under the tutelage of um, Lucian Crump. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was telling some of these younger individuals that I worked in this art industry for five years without any pay. Just yeah. to learn, just to get the exposure, just to be able to be around what we would call your, your the, the strong players in the marketplace, yeah. the strong artists to be invited back, to all back, the dinner parties and back in the day, like nobody, most people didn't come in with a lot of money. I yeah. I, I can remember but today the they're different. Part, so they like if you don't pay me this much, I'm out. Well, what about the opportunity to learn and then learn? Uh, the well, that's because that's because most artists today don't have nowhere near the experience the other artists had in that in that doing up to that time. We all had a crash course in business, mm-hmm. trial and error. You got your ass whipped. You got robbed. You got <laughs> stuff. Stolen. Exactly. Yeah, you're you right. Had, we, you got you robbed. Go we got robbed. Got all the dudes and see no artists coming in now. They don't pay the dues. They, they don't think they feel like they have to because they don't understand what you got to do to really promote the work. And that's something I've been an advocate about with artists really from the beginning. I'm a, I'm a, I've mentored hundreds of artists on the same subject. And even the work ethic is different. Back during that time, you talking about 200 of the top of the game mm-hmm. competing against each other. They were out there doing it. And you looked over to your left, you looked over to your right, and if your stuff wasn't up to par, you wasn't going to make it. Now, exactly. any and everybody can come into the game. They got a little mm-hmm. look. I look at most artists, their portfolio ain't nowhere near what we were producing. 
Right. You know. So with that being uh, said, Poncho, talk to me a little bit about the internet and how you think this has changed the structure of the business oh, from man, artist standpoint. Was, I'll talk to you a little woo. bit about from the gallery standpoint because now mm -hmm. you know people can go straight to the artist. But I do see some challenges there as far as them building their prominence and and, and different things like that. By now, well, see, you can gallery. remember back in the day when that what that competition was making sure you locked down the people in your area. And you were right. very, very good at that. This is my territory right here. Don't y'all come in this place right here. And artists, if you come work with me, you're going to do, you're going to do it this way. And a yeah. lot of people had that mentality back then. The internet made global accessibility affected everything. And so, so many of the rules and regulations we used to live by back in the day, they don't apply now. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, all those 4,000 galleries that we had they're on the internet. <laughs> they're, they're individual people. They're galleries. They're all kinds of other opportunities to sell. Mm -hmm. And so what artists are doing now is that they would have post their work internationally, almost from this jump, just by having a halfway decent website. Mm -hmm. they, they already can feel whether people like or don't like their work from uh, from social. What, right. That's not really true. They don't know who don't like their work. <laughs> because if they ever put a I hate it button, on there, mm -hmm. the whole internet would implode overnight. <laughs> yeah. But what well, I'm saying well, is, Pancho, like, let's, let, let, see, let's back, back, back when we were doing this, trying to hold on to your following wasn't even a sensibility to us. We were making so much money. Yeah, absolutely. We and most of us barely had mailing lists. We, we barely See, Pancho, I put some of that money under my bed, and that's why I'm still able to survive today. No, and that's why we're one of the 400 locations because we put a lot under the mattress. I, so I every understand. now and then I had to go under there and just pull out a stack. I understand, you know? but, I, but I know some people that had less than that who kept going straight through. <laughs> you know, it's all kind. Of, See, there's all kinds of ideology. The thing that happened right. with this thing going international right. and global was that you got to really see firsthand in, 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 in a kind of a, a, a real serious front view of what's mm -hmm. happening across the board. And so it's no longer a regional game anymore. All, and most mm -hmm. of the rules that we had, the regulations and, 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 and ethics that we had then uh, don't apply so much today. I think the, the right. basics do. But I, you know, I look at artists now, and some of them are not ready, and they're but they're selling, and so then uh, it becomes about the money. It doesn't come become about the craft or what they're doing, mm -hmm. and so the artists can come out now with a look and a price point that will give them the illusion that they got some momentum. Right. And most of these well, artists, let's talk a little bit about you coming in, and that they need to go to Soulful Rhythms, um. Dot com soulful rhythms. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm, to gonna play, I'm gonna play the commercial that we've been running, y'all. So go to your Facebook pages, go to your Instagram pages, you'll see a little bit uh more information about the show. But I'm just gonna run this real mm -hmm. quick. So I want to make sure they're yeah. RSVPN so they can get in to see you, Poncho, just to talk to you, to hear your perspective, whether they're collectors, they're guests, they're artists. We even see Today, what I'm seeing stronger before you run that is I'm seeing a lot of artists that are actually collecting. And I think there's oh they're, man, no man. They're, I think they're collecting stronger today than they were back in the golden age. Well, era. you gotta remember this is a cumulative business. Mm -hmm. So the people who started collecting back then, man, artists, we were trading stuff, giving stuff to each other. Right. right I always crazy. have 500 pieces by other artists in addition to my work because we've been so giving. And see, people don't talk about the camaraderie of artists and how we support each other and the things that we do. Um, but yeah, artists now are more savvy with collecting. Artists now are more savvy with business. Artists now are more savvy with marketing. Artists now are more savvy with holding on and reaching their customer base. Uh, and those are the changes that were an advent as your, your, from your earlier question about the advent of the internet. The internet changed all of that. And it's everybody now has... Uh, mm -hmm. 50 60 percent of their um in revenue coming in through sales online and then we just recently with covid added right. another whole thing like this whole online i'm thinking we're doing right now because that was another right. revenue maker we was able to tap into people in their house right while they were locked in with their job and they were fixing up 
Right, so right. We keep having they taking those fashion. vacations, so they've been spending an art. Now we oh, know that African American art is the fastest growing well, one hold of that the thought. Hold that, segment hold, hold of the that entire thought. art world. Hold that thought, because I want you to really elaborate on that. Because I, mm -hmm. I, we got, we both got a lot to say about that. But I want to run this so they can see what's going on. Hello, I'm Ian Grant, CEO and curator of Emotion Fine Arts. Soulful Rhythm Art Show represents the booming voice and color of Africa. It represents the way we walk. It represents the way we talk. What up, though? It represents the way we dance. It represents the way we communicate with each other. Hello, this is Larry Poncho Brown, and it has been eight years since I've done an exhibition in Detroit. I'm coming your way. The show is called Soulful Rhythms. You know, when people try to describe my work, those are the two words that they use most frequently to describe my work. So I'm looking forward to coming down, bringing some small originals, bringing my new book, which is the 40th retrospective book of my 40 years being an artist. I'm hoping you guys will come and fellowship with us and have a good time. Anybody that comes out to the show, that's that's what they're gonna get from our artists. They're gonna see that it's it's something that's introspective, coming from the heart. But it, it represents the Midwest and just a, a certain mindset that, that comes from when you grew up in that that particular environment, a art environment, um, black excellence environment. You know, the city, the the hustle and bustle of, of coming up in the city and all that. So. I'm Lawrence Gary, and this is Shades of Beauty. And Shades of Beauty represents soulful rhythms because it represents the soul of all of us. So please, RSVP at soulfulrhythm.com. Thank you. Yes, sir. So that's the background information for the show, y'all. I mean, in case you guys uh, really want to get a chance to make sure you check out that website. Tell them a little bit about the website, Ian. Um, again, go to Soulful Rhythms. That's Soulful, R-H-Y-T-H-M-S dot com. And you need to RSVP. The opening is on September 16th and 17th. Come on out and talk to Poncho and just see what an internationally acclaimed artist is about, how they develop the marketplace and, you know, what his mindset is and, and where he's going in the future. So we invite you to come on out to Emotion Fine Arts on Friday, September, again, on Friday, September um, 16th and um, Saturday, September 17th. So please RSVP, soulforrhythms.com. Man, you sound like you've been doing this before, man. <laughs> oh. Well, Pancho, we're having a lot of fun in this business. As I said, I retired. I, I I left a corporate job. I left a job where we had opportunities at times to fly on the corporate jet. So I want to get back on that corporate jet. But this time, Emoja is going to pay for that corporate jet, I'm not, not the corporation. You, so um, that's the vision we have. When we say that we need to be eight hours over the Baltic overseas, that we're introducing the music r and b and we're introducing the visual arts at the same time with the top stars eight hours over maybe in sweden amsterdam or whatever we need to be coming in on our private jets so as, you can see, look, as you can see mr ian grant that's why i love his brother right here his visions are never small never have been small uh but i want you guys to come out for more than one reason hey i have i haven't been in detroit in eight years uh, i've done some uh Two other galleries have represented me over the years uh, there. And this will be my first time coming in and just uh, reacquainting myself with the market there. Um, if you look at my book, most of you have seen one of the pieces in that book. That's the way. This book is of my published works. That's what's so important. It's not the entirety of my portfolio. These are the works that have been published since 1985. And so, yes, yeah, a lot of familiarity in that book. But guess what? We had to take out 100 images from that book to make it fit uh, smoothly the way we did. We took a lot of time to design that book. 
It's been a two and a half year process, and, uh, not counting uh, COVID, the COVID lock-in. But I had a really good staff, Joe Ford and Donna Gardner, who helped me design this book. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign to garner support for it. Uh, we got crazy support, which allowed us to make the book larger, include more images, and make it museum quality. So, Pancho, over 300 images. What I want to ask you is, are most of those images in that book, are most of those originals sold? Most of those originals are sold. So, basically, the originals that we will see here at Emoja Fine Arts is new and hot off the press. Hot off the press. But, hey, the reality is most collectors don't get to see the entirety of any artist's portfolio. So to be able to have access to originals at this point is a wonderful thing because before, you know, the artist might have 20 prints in the booth, all different sizes and price ranges, and they might have two sketches on the, on the bottom that was priced to go. You came in because you saw the big Charles Biz piece. That's what you wanted. That's what you fell in love with. That's what you bought for five years. But you walked past an original he had in there for $500. And that was my specialty collecting area. If you look at all of the originals I collect mm -hmm. for myself, they're the type of pieces I bring to this show. These are eight and a half by 11, 11 by 14, a little, a little smaller, one of a kind pieces, only ones on planet Earth. But I like to bring them out now to show people something that they've never seen. The book shows you an overview of what's out there. And I would say at least one third of those images are still available today in print form on our websites. But the original pieces, and they don't, they don't last long because we're in that kind of time now. People are looking for small and medium-sized originals. And uh, not to say we've sold more large originals in the last decade than we've ever sold. Well, Pancho, you know, one thing, you know, um, a third or more of our show is known to sell out before the door even opens, you know, up to 50% of mm -hmm. that because, you know, we will, again, start showing the work three, four days before the show. If they follow up on the website, they could see it. They could purchase right then and, and, and get to work. So that's really, really been exceptional. That's really, really exciting. Now, I have a question for you, Pancho. Mm -hmm. What have you seen change in the modern world right now? And where do you think the business is going today as we are one of the fastest growing segments of the entire art world with our booming colors of Africa? They can't take that from us because we go into the belly. It's We go below the belly button to pull out our experiences and put it on canvas. Look at those colors behind you. Look how they're booming. And so I we, we say that's the booming color and the booming voice of Africa. Can well, everything is imitated. Everything is imitated. But there's a there's a there is a spiritual connection to the work that nobody can imitate. Everybody can wear mm -hmm. bright colors and use them. Everybody mm -hmm. can do figurative. Everybody can do abstract. You know, the thing now is that um, we just got to sit down and slow down, slow the pulse rate down and get back to some sensibilities. You know, culture is everything. And what artists do is they capture uh, they capture the essence of what life is now. Now, I'll tell you, back in 1980, I could not sell a socially conscious image. In 1980, I could barely sell a civil rights themed image. In 1980, there was a lot of cotton fields and southern uh, uh, pieces, and, and I'm not down in that because that's that's part of the reflections that we need to see. But this current time now, because of all of the social injustice that's happening, you now see a lot of artists doing social pieces, which never would have sold in the period when we were doing what we were doing. Very few of them. We had a couple slip through. But for the most part, the whole market now is like I couldn't sell a nude in 1990. I definitely couldn't sell one in 80. Now, I noticed you have expanded on your nude line pretty extensively. Well, because the demand for different things, we're becoming more. Let me let me let me lay it down for y'all. Whatever stage you're at in your life right now, you are the most sophisticated art buyer of this time. There's more information in the last 30 years that nobody's ever acquired before. So while we sound structured, this is still in its infancy. And then we'll begin to see that now with the reference he made of, of how art is being accepted in the fine art realm right now. It's crazy. But what happens is you got a lot of artists now looking at that and imitating it. Like there's a lot of Basquiat-esque pieces coming out right now. In 80, nobody mm -hmm. knew who he was. Nobody cared because he was in a different 
facet of the business than we were in. We were in the commercial side of the business. Mm-hmm. And so now these young kids are looking at Basquiat and, oh, I, they get the formula. They go out and get themselves some uh, big brush and some oil pastels. And now they think they're Basquiat or doing images that reflect mm-hmm. that work. It's a lot of things happening right now where artists don't have a sensibility anymore. Artists are painting from um, the, the window of their their, their phones now. They're, they're looking at it. And, and like back in the day, we had very few uh, books that depicted black people. So if a book ever came out, we all grabbed it up. We probably sold them books out. But what happened is artists were drawing from books. So I might be traveling and see 20 versions of something I did in a book, <laughs> from a book. Mm-hmm. You know, nowadays artists are doing their own reference shots. But man, I'm gonna tell you one thing the big hack that happened. All of the artists that were in that international uh, level, man, when the business imploded, they went into themselves and they're coming up with some of the baddest stuff. They are pushing the business. They are pushing the interest to African-American art. So, I mean, I'm just hope telling y'all, if y'all, if you're coming out, I want you to come out, see what's happening. Ian ain't telling you what he's getting ready to do. Ian is getting ready to set Detroit on fire. Because Ian knows every last one of those artists that we're talking about. He has a, I could brag on his brother. He has the. Well, we're going to bring him in one by one, Pancho. Yeah, but he still has the greatest relationship with artists. And that's something that's very difficult to hold over 30 years because a lot of people made mistakes. Believe me, we were making money hand over fist. And a lot of times things went down. But to have that kind of reputation and that knowledge of what's going on. You know, so I hope that people in Detroit and uh, are really understanding what this guy, I'm going to point the other way, what this guy has to offer. You know, you got some people that are experts in their field. That's what this dude is. Just like I feel like I'm an expert in what I do. I represent the international artists. We're all friends. We all um, mm-hmm. uh, support each other. Uh, the camaraderie of artists has always been off the charts. We are the craziest dysfunctional group of, 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 of cousins, but we love each other. We share opportunities, we share information. And so uh, that's some of the stuff you feel when you come to these shows. It's not just the painting on the wall. You're getting the essence of all of that stuff mixed together when you come into a room. So, Poncho, as we get ready to start maybe wrapping it up. No, no, let me finish. Yeah, yeah. I want you to tell the Detroit people. Let me finish. Okay, go ahead, Poncho. All right. There's a time when we have to come in and be sponges to what's happening. This time may never happen again. You know, uh, Ian is trying to do some things with you guys to bring you another notch up on understanding what this whole thing is about. And that's what this is. That's why I come to Detroit. I'm coming to Detroit to educate just like I did back in the 80s. You know, so, you know, we're dedicated to this. I'm dedicated to this. So now you can uh, uh, ask me your question, bro. Well, you kind of answered the question. You, you kind of anticipated what I was going to say. But I want you to tell Detroit why you chose them to be first on the national tour list. And what are your expectations from them? Uh, I can tell you I don't have expectations, man. My job okay. at this point in my career is expanding my reach. And the only okay. way I can expand my reach is going into different regions. And so I constantly go back into regions where I used to show and I'm meeting more and more new customers than I ever did before. The old favorites come, my loyalists come, but for every loyalist and old favorite, I got two or three new customers that come. So my any, any, is- any reason why Detroit was first, or did you just throw the data, or was it because no, I called you, Boncho? You was brave enough to call a brother. Okay. That's why you called, you called and you said, Hey man, come and come and do this with me. You know, okay. we have that kind of relationship. I want people to understand this is just not Ian hiring me to come in and and, and and do a dog and pony show for two days or a weekend or a month. This is a relationship of 30 years. A lot of respect, a lot of opportunity. This is my big brother. We tease each other all the time. Now you can see it. And we, we step on each other's comments. We argue all the time. But at the end of the day, we smiling because we realize that we have dedicated our lives to enriching uh, our people with the images that are being circulated. So it's a very serious, it's a serious business for us. You're right. Uh, and but this market, because when they come back and they check the archival records, 
they're going to come to the arts first. And we want to make sure that we're showing positive images of who we are and whose we are, and that we're showing our people positive images is that they feel positive about who they are. Well, and the reality, the reality is that's something that this business offered from the very beginning, the positivity. But the reality mm -hmm. is now we're beyond just hanging pretty pictures on the wall. That's what I'm saying to you. The times are changing. So be prepared to see something that's going to challenge your mind and your heart. Be prepared to see something that's going to make you go, man, I might need to take that home with me. It, it, be prepared to see something that's going to you might not want to see because it's about education. It's about artist expression. There's no way we can deal with the subject of police brutality and the things that's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement and it not come on an artist if it did something severely wrong. You know, and that's what we're beginning to see. We're seeing a bigger cross section of expressions than we've ever seen in history. And so that's the importance of coming out just to see what's up, get caught up, but also get on that wave of seeing the people at the ends about to bring Detroit. You Over know. the next three to five years, the investments right, have already right. been made, and we're going to bring them in, um, again, the internationals, and we're going to mix, mix them with the local, because our job is to help bring the local artists up, you know, some of the artists we have on our team, to take mm -hmm. them to an international level, and that's what it's all about. We're doing this here from Detroit. So make sure you RSVP at Soulful Rhythms, R-H-Y-T-H-M-S dot com, to come in and see Poncho, to come in and see Joyce Jeffrey to come in and see Abe Ilo, Annie Lee's grandson, my one of my great mentors, and also Lawrence Gary, emerging artist coming up here in this Detroit marketplace. It's very, very key and important. Thank you, Pancho. Yeah, I'm gonna tell y'all, it's some exciting art happening all over the country, y'all. So come on out, join us, have a good time, have a little fellowship, crack a few jokes at our expense. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, I, so we're gonna have you, brother. I told you I would go really quickly, man. Yes, sir. But, uh, we talked about a lot of things. I hope we touched on a few subjects. You know, uh, we were so engaged in the conversation. There were quite a few people that were giving us all kinds of uh, uh, things here. Uh, but we're keeping up with it. Thank you all for tuning in and listening to the conversation. Uh, we got a question here. How do you know what artists and pieces are best invested? I'm going to let you answer that question for Miss Lancaster. Well, basically, um, when you come to the show, you you want to be able to research the artists, what they're doing in the marketplace, what museums they might be in, and um, basically, where 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 is this artist going? What mediums are they painting in? Are they doing oils? Are they doing um, pastels? Are they doing acrylics? On and on and on. So it depends on the stage. So we try to give you all the stages. We we said that earlier. We have an emerging artist for you. We have two premier artists for you, and we have one internationally acclaimed artist so it's going to be a different price range so it depends on where you are as a collector where you will be collecting but we tried to hit all three of the stages that we felt was important well i want to thank you all for tuning in these are really nice uh uh, uh accolades folks are putting on the screen uh we had about maybe 25 30 people watching the show hey when you get a chance share 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 this video once we're done uh spread it around keep on enriching because we're coming to Detroit. We're going to be ready. Thank you. Got you, you want to add? You nope. got you want to add in? I just want to say thank you to all our lovely guests that has put us in the position that we're in to be able to be a world-class company. Please keep in mind, Detroiters, we represent Detroit wherever we go. Emoja Fine Arts means unity. It means unifying. We represent Detroit all throughout the world. So when they see Emoja Fine Arts, they're like, that's a Detroit company. This is the Detroit swag. This is the Detroit behavior. This is what we expect from Detroit. So thank you. We look forward to seeing you. RSVP, soulfulrhythms.com. That's you. right, y'all. We'll be looking for you. And meanwhile, just keep on checking out all of our Facebook and social. We'll be keeping you up to date on what's happening. And uh, what was how many months time we got, man? Was that two weeks? We got a week and a half? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah. We're putting it down. We're in the fourth quarter. You know what happens when we're in the fourth quarter. Yeah, Maybe we, we hit hard and we keep hitting. <laughs> All right? It's showtime. Let's go. <laughs> All right, y'all. We want to thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, looks like we might, have to, we might have to do another session. I don't know. We had a lot of good questions. Um, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, y'all, uh, on the Poncho Perspective, we plan on having discussions like this. This is the first episode featuring my big brother here. And we'll be talking some more. Hope to see you all soon. Take care. Love to everyone.